Are you a prepper or homesteader looking to connect with like-minded people in your area? Looking to start your own preparedness group? Already have a group? Well, look no further than PrepperNet. PrepperNet is dedicated to personal responsibility, individual freedoms, and being self-reliant. PrepperNet has monthly meetings in over 100 cities where you can meet and learn with like-minded people in your area. PrepperNet, where preppers unite. Find us online at PrepperNet.com. Survive. Thrive. Stay alive. It's time to get prepared with the Prepping Academy Podcast. Hello, everyone. It is Patrick. I am stealing Force Chair again to talk to you about communications and do a little bit of an after-action report on the Amron T-Rex exercise and how that went for PrepperNet. But first... A couple of other things to bring to your attention and to talk about. It has been a crazy month of July. It has been absolutely nonstop since the beginning. And now I'm finally getting a chance to sit down and talk about uh, what we did during July. I went to the uh, Eastern Tennessee Homestead Alliance Festival, had a wonderful time. Uh, It was a great event, something you should consider going and checking out. Uh, I think they're already selling tickets to the next one. So, uh, Definitely uh, definitely a fun event. Lots of family stuff, lots of good things. That was a great time. Got to see a lot of PrepperNet folks that came out. Uh, and we've been just having a good time here locally uh, doing, the, doing the thing here with, uh, with PrepperNet. Been all kinds of crazy news. We had the assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Biden has dropped out of the race. It's one thing after another in this insane news cycle, which is why we do communications. Knowing and knowledge and information helps us make better decisions. And we're so used to receiving that information at the drop of a hat every day from our smartphones and other devices that without that, it would change the way we do things and would change our lives. So we talk about communications because in a grid down or another scenario where our normal communications are disrupted, it will really change the world we live in, and how we do things day to day. And speaking of that, CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, has released a statement recently that uh, it is a public service announcement, and I'm just going to read the text to you guys. This public service announcement is to raise awareness that distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks on election infrastructure or adjacent infrastructure that supports election operations could hinder public access to election information. Okay, there's some other stuff about it not affecting the integrity of the election process and all sorts of other things like that in the article. But the point that I bring this up is, again, with communications, we are dependent upon the Internet, we are dependent upon critical infrastructure, and the opportunities for that to fail are endless. And many folks have wondered, well, what's going to happen in November? What's going to be the surprise that messes with the election? Well, maybe there you have it, folks. It might be some sort of cyber attack. Is their hand being tipped? Is that what is being planned? Who knows? I'm sure that there's lots of foreign actors and other folks that would also like to disrupt things. So as always, stay frosty, my friends. It is a crazy world and a unending cycle of chaos. It seems like we can't get ahead. And every time we think we've got our arms wrapped around something, another crazy event or another thing out of left field happens. Who had that on your bingo card, as some would say. So let's talk about T-Rex. T-Rex is the Amron uh, Tawidika, or end of the world as we know it, communications exercise. They do it every year. PrepperNet has participated for the last four years on some level. And we usually do our own thing alongside as well as participate directly. Because practicing for the end of the world as we know it is more than just a communications exercise. It also impacts every aspect of our daily lives and our plans. So it's a good opportunity to test all of those things. So let's talk about some of the things that we learned or I learned and have heard from others about this particular T-Rex exercise. So as we start, the T-Rex exercise is supposed to be a grid down exercise. You're supposed to operate completely off of alternative or non-grid tied energy for the duration of the exercise. 
Now, my particular station, uh, we're talking about radio again here, has been uh, running on solar power for months. So this was not really much of a challenge for me. But other folks did get to learn some about what kind of battery capacity they had, how much power they actually used, how well their solar setups worked, all sorts of different things. And it was a great opportunity for them to test that out. Few folks learned some new things, but many folks were pleasantly surprised at how well their systems did work, at least for the weekend. Although I encourage anyone who is attempting to do that sort of thing and planning to use that sort of thing off-grid that you really need to do more than just a weekend uh, if you're going to test it. I made the decision to do it continuously, but that doesn't work for everyone I know. But having a plan and being able to do that is a... uh, critical part of knowing it's going to work when that you need it and it's one of those skills that if you don't practice it continuously uh, it things break things don't work you forget how to do things especially under stress and under pressure and that's going to bring us to some of the shortcomings in t-rex later but first i want to talk about some of the successes so uh, we had a lot of new people participating in T-Rex this year, and a lot of folks learned some great new stuff and had some wonderful successes in participating. And it's always exciting to me to see new folks who are learning, get that first piece of traffic, have that first success, and really get energized and, and charged and, and wanting more uh, now that they figured out the basics. And at PrepperNet, we did a few things for receive-only stations. A lot of those folks are only using JS8 call, which is a weak signal mode. Uh, You can learn more about that by uh, doing a quick Google search for JS8 call or checking out some videos on YouTube. Uh, It is a very popular weak signal mode. It's very slow. And one of the common things I got from a lot of people is that's it. That's all the information I got. And that, again, goes back to, well, it's really slow. It's just a few words per minute. So very hard to pass really detailed and useful information in it. You can pass little blurbs and blips, but uh, you're not going to get a full report through JS8 call in any time uh, that most people have to transmit, especially when you're operating off-grid and every one of those watts you burn is precious energy. But we did. We had a lot of new stations that were learning. I got a, quite a few check-ins online, folks saying, hey, yeah, we copied what was going on. So uh, that was exciting and great news for PrepperNet. Uh, We also had uh, some success with uh, an unexpected situation that arose during T-Rex. Prior to, or I should say, after T-Rex was scheduled, a a radio teletype or RIDI contest was scheduled for that Saturday evening. And uh, there was a lot of traffic on the amateur radio bands for the RIDI contest. And I'm going to pick on the Ritty Contest people here for just a minute because I sometimes wonder how they expect anyone to respond to them because you see them all up and down the band transmitting CQ, CQ over and over and over again with only a couple of seconds pause between each transmission. So I always wonder how how does someone break in and get a hold of them. But anyway, uh, we had to work through some QRM from the Ritty Contest. Uh, We had great success with some narrower band modes to be able to find a spot uh, in between all the traffic and uh, all the ready CQs and contest folks and slip some traffic through that we needed to get through. It was slow. It was arduous. It was uh, frustrating at times, but we did have some success. And, And that's a real win for preparing for a real world situation where you really don't know exactly what you're going to face. It could be a lot of people on the air and you're trying to find a spot to get information through. Or it could be interference or other problems that require you to think outside the box and come up with a solution. So that practice and understanding is a, is a great way to get more prepared and uh, develop some better skills. So those are some great successes. Uh, we had good success with the modes that we used. Uh, the standard, uh, if you've looked at our communications SOI, which is available at PrepperNet.net, uh, using standard modes that we use in the FL Digi suite. Again, you can learn more about FL Digi in the PrepperNet Ham Academy or doing a quick YouTube search for FL Digi. Uh, it's a uh, Swiss Army knife of tools uh, for amateur radio and data over radio. It's very intimidating to people who are new simply because it can do so much. But once you get the hang of it and realize that out of the hundreds of different data modes that are capable, 
that you're probably only going to use a few for your particular application becomes much more manageable. So uh, if you read our SOI, it kind of walks you through the modes that are common for what we do and uh, how we use them uh, and can kind of help you get a bit of a kickstart going on that. But we had great success with that. Uh, we had good success with some of the other high-speed data modes uh, that we use to move traffic around. Uh, and there was a lot of traffic. Uh, I personally received over 30 pieces of traffic. And we call it traffic. It's a, it's a message. It's a formatted message. Traffic would be like a fax or some other type of form that you might receive, uh, almost like an email and uh, has details about a particular situation, incident, or other, um, other things. So uh, I received quite a few pieces of traffic. Uh, I'm fairly centrally located, so that's usually pretty easy for me, uh, in spite of some fairly rough van conditions. But we had, we had good luck uh, with that. We did uh, have a few failures and some shortcomings, though. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about some of those failures and shortcomings that we had in T-Rex and what we learned from them and how they actually might benefit you and your personal group. So one of the big shortcomings that we saw was a lack of following naming conventions. And what I mean by that is we have an agreed upon, it's listed in our signals operating instructions, many other organizations, any group that you're associated with, it's probably going to have some sort of convention they use for naming documents or files that are sent over the radio. And why that this is important is it helps the people who are receiving it, one, know what it is, because oftentimes if we're handling information that is not directed to us during an event, we actually don't open it and read it. We just look at the, the name of the file, and then we send it on where it needs to go uh, because we don't have time to, you know, as it were, read other people's mail. So make sure that you follow the naming convention that's provided to you for the exercise, event, or that your group creates for itself. Uh, otherwise, your traffic may get misrouted, lost, or completely uh, ignored because nobody knows what it is, and they don't have time to read it and then try to figure out and play Detective Caluso uh, and figure out what exactly it is or where it is supposed to be going. So pay attention to those things and make sure that you understand your naming. And if you're building a communications plan for your personal group, make sure you create a naming convention that covers all the important things. So when people look at it uh, and you've got 35 pieces of information setting in front of you that you're scrolling down the list of, you can easily find the piece of information that you need or the piece of information that someone else needs. <clears throat> Another thing that goes back to reading your instructions or your signals operating instructions and understanding your communications plan for the group that you're part of uh, or uh, the group that you're building is on amateur radio digital modes. We have something called a waterfall. And to explain a waterfall, a waterfall is a visual depiction of the video frequency band that you're receiving. So if a HF radio is receiving three kilohertz, the non-technical people are going, what is he talking about? But think audio. So think three kilohertz or about the bandwidth of a telephone communication. The waterfall allows you to visualize that. And at different places on that waterfall, PrepperNet, Amron, various other organizations may place different data modes at different places on that waterfall because you can do that and you can run more than one piece of software at a time while on the same frequency, allowing you to accomplish different goals. So one of the problems we ran into is, again, in our signals operating instructions, there are instructions about where each mode operates and where it's supposed to be so it doesn't cause interference with other modes. But we had a lot of people who were kind of all over the place at times, uh, particularly with JS8 call, that cause interference to other modes. Uh, and that's very frustrating to people who are working hard trying to move information when that they get interference because somebody is not following the guidelines and the plan that was set out. And in the real world, that becomes a real problem because you may not have an easy way to get to that person and go, hey, uh, you're, you're causing interference and you're inhibiting people from getting potentially life-saving or critical information through. 
So pay attention to those things. Read your communications plan. If you're part of a group, read that comms plan. Have a copy of it printed out. Put it on the bookshelf. Put it with your radio gear. Uh, Go through, pick the important things. Create yourself a quick reference card. Laminate it. Print it on right in the rain paper. Do what you need to do so you've got that available. Especially if you're not doing what you should and practicing a couple of times a week. You go to the gym a few times a week. You go to the rifle range a couple times a month. You do things to practice your skills. If you're not doing that with radio, when the the rubber meets the road, you're going to forget, especially under stress, and you're going to go, okay, how do I do this? What do I do? How do I fix this problem? And having that written list is critical to making that work. Hey, let's take a quick break. Are you a prepper or homesteader looking to connect with like-minded people in your area? Looking to start your own preparedness group? Already have a group? Well, look no further than PrepperNet. PrepperNet is dedicated to personal responsibility, individual freedoms, and being self-reliant. PrepperNet has monthly meetings in over 100 cities where you can meet and learn with like-minded people in your area. PrepperNet, where preppers unite. Find us online at PrepperNet.com. Especially if you're trying to bring someone new in, trying to help someone uh, get set up, or uh, if you have to kind of hand it off to someone while you go deal with another issue. Because remember, uh, as much as we would like to think we get to sit behind the radio all the time, probably not going to happen in a real emergency. We're going to be dealing with other problems and issues. And that's one of the reasons why some of us like digital modes so much, or data modes uh, is a more appropriate thing, because having that text that is received, that message, that email type, document allows you to come back and read it even if you weren't at the radio when it was received. So you don't have to have someone there monitoring the radio continuously in order to get valuable information. So other issues that we had is the ability to move information across the country. And oftentimes that requires a relay, particularly with HF radio, especially in the very bad band conditions we had during T-Rex. We struggled a bit to get information uh, over long distances uh, because either stations weren't available. And we have to remember that the crowd strike thing happened just a, the day literally before uh, T-Rex kind of got started. So a lot of people that were planning to participate had to go to work and deal with crowd strike problems. There was a whole lot of real world things that were kind of jumping on board and causing people to drop offline. And that was actually a really good thing. Because in a real emergency, a real disaster, real whatever, you're going to have people that you think are going to be there that aren't for whatever reason. And having a plan to identify, okay, well, if my whole plan falls apart because Jim Bob didn't show up today, uh, we need to have a backup plan and we need to have a workaround. So we identified a lot of issues there that we need to figure out some workarounds to. And that was a really good, uh, really good exercise and a really good learning experience for a lot of us on that front as well. Uh, Next was band planning. That's another issue I have here. And what I mean by band planning is having a plan to uh, move from one HF radio band to another as needed. Many of us during our training exercises, our weekly nets, we do a lot of those things. We tend to stick on 40 meters and 80 meters because we want local and regional coverage. We want that near vertical incident sky wave, and you can Google that term and learn a lot about that, but um, it's for communications with HF radio within, you know, three to 500 miles around your location primarily, and a lot of people are used to that. So they're all used to being able to hear each other, used to very straightforward communications, especially in the emergency world where the that's kind of where we focus is on the things that immediately have an impact on us. At times, we need to communicate a bit further and having a plan to move to some higher frequency bands that allow us to communicate over a much greater distance is critical. And PrepperNet has that. It's part of our SOI, but it's not a part of our SOI that we train on. And for people who are wondering, an SOI is a signals operating instructions. It's like a, a communications uh, plan. And because we don't train on those higher bands, some people were not as familiar with what to expect. 
because when you're on those higher bands, you don't hear the people that are around you. You only hear the people that are halfway across or all the way across the country, and, and you can't hear the people nearby. And that's disorienting to people who are used to seeing all kinds of signals around them and suddenly don't. So uh, that that's kind of a training gap that we've realized we need to focus on a little bit more within PrepperNet and preparing people for a little more of what it's like to need to communicate if you do need to get that message to grandma or your daughter uh, that's on the other side of the country. Uh, one of those things, again, training issue, something we can work through. Net scheduling, uh, we have a scheduled plan. It's part of our signals operating instructions. Sometimes we have to vary that for various uh, reasons, uh, but that was a little bit of a shortcoming uh, within T-Rex was getting some of that scheduling kind of hammered out and people all in the right place at the right time. And one of the things that comes from this is this goes back to that planning and using radio on a regular basis is something that people that aren't radio folks oftentimes struggle with. And this is Zulu time or UTC time because in the radio world, we're often communicating across time zones. It's not unusual for us to span two, three, four time zones at the same time while communicating. Uh, it's very confusing to people who are used to doing that to try to figure out what time zone someone's in and keep track of multiple different times. So we oftentimes use Zulu time or UTC time, which is the same everywhere. Well, that causes confusion for people who aren't used to using UTC time when they look at the net schedule and see, oh, well, it's at uh, 0300 uh, Zulu, and they're not really sure when that is, or they mistranslate it, and they don't realize that, you know, that's 10 p.m. Eastern Daylight. Uh, they, they're confused, and they, they miss a net, or they miss that scheduled communications window. So that's another thing to print out. Make sure you have in your book. I'm actually adding one to the upcoming PrepperNet Signals Operating Instructions version 2. It'll be in an appendix. You can print it, keep it, stick it on the ham shack, put it in your waterproof binder, whatever you need to do. But it's a chart to help you convert uh, Zulu time to local time because you don't want to miss that communications window, especially when there's not an easy way to coordinate for another communications window. You've got a plan with friends, and there's not another way to communicate. Uh, those communications windows are, can be a lifeline. Uh, learning, practicing, doing that kind of thing. It took me a long time when I first got into amateur radio to get my head around the Zulu time thing. So if it takes you a while, don't feel bad. It's just part of it. And some people, you'll go into their ham radio station. You know, they have a nice station set up at home. And they'll have multiple clocks on the wall with different time zones so they can look and see what time it is in different time zones or Zulu time, just like you might see uh, in a, a tactical operations center or that kind of thing, because time is important. Uh, it's how we coordinate. It's things we do. And I've alluded to band conditions a couple of times. So band conditions have been... Uh, in the last couple of years in T-Rex, testing and trying of men's souls. There has been a, uh, we are, as many folks probably know, uh, next year will be the peak of the solar cycle. Uh, so in radio world, when the solar cycle is nearing its peak, we get lots of band openings. We get lots of opportunities to communicate on 10 meters and 12 meters and Bands that don't work at a solar minimum, and it becomes easy when those bands are working to talk to Africa and Europe and Australia and, you know, all the way around the world. The problem is there are other times at a solar maximum when the sun is acting up and there's a solar storm going on or um, there's a coronal mass ejection or things like that, that it just completely trashes the HF bands and communication on HF becomes extremely difficult because of the noise uh, and propagation problems that are generated by the CME. So for a couple of years in a row with T-Rex, we've had to deal with what were pretty terrible band conditions at some point. It, it's always a little disheartening when you're in an exercise and you know there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of people out there trying to connect and communicate and you're seeing absolutely nobody on the radio. And it's like, is my radio broken? What's going on? But it's the band conditions. 
And it's easy for new people to get very frustrated by that as well. They're like, I'm not receiving anything. What's wrong? Well, it's the band conditions. Uh, the sun is not being cooperative. So we struggled with that during this T-Rex, especially on Saturday. Uh, the bands were just not very good. And we were only able to communicate, you know, a few hundred miles effectively without really struggling. And that made it hard to move some pieces of traffic where we would only get a partial copy on a message. Uh, it was just, it was difficult. So uh, we had to work very hard to get around some of those things uh, and kind of kind of struggle through it. And that's a good training exercise in persistence and persistence and trying to get that information through. It's also good to know and to plan around those sorts of things. So if it does happen, okay, we try again later. We have another communications window coming up, and we'll try to move the information there. And hopefully it's not something that is so critical that a few hours or a day's difference is going to really uh, cause a lot of trouble, especially if it's being moved over 500, 800, 1,000 miles. Th- those are struggles that we had and uh, good learning experiences for folks that were new to it. Uh, I got into uh, some of this stuff years ago uh, during a solar minimum, and uh, that was kind of kind of challenging too because there was very little band activity that wasn't regional or local because the solar minimum made it very difficult to to communicate across the ocean. You know, I was super excited as a noob when I uh, finally got to make my first European contact, and other people were like, oh, I started doing a solar maximum, and I got 200 European contacts in the first year. And it's like, wow. But now that we're in a solar maximum, it's it's much easier to do that, and you, you learn and you understand, okay, this isn't a continuous, um, continuous state, and that all these things change throughout cycles in time, and that's something that just takes years of experience to learn. And that's why radio can be kind of hard because you got to spend the time, you got to get the wheel time or the, you know, the, the flight time in on communications in order to really gain that experience and know what to expect and, and how to deal with it. As we move on, you know, those were the good, those were the bad. Overall, T-Rex was a wonderful exercise. Uh, a lot of people learn things. We identified a lot of stuff, as we do every year, to improve. And that's part of training. That's why we train. We train to, one, perfect the things that we are good at, but two, identify our shortcomings so we can address those. And if you're not training in a way where you're identifying your shortcomings and building plans to work around that, then you're probably not spending your training hours effectively. We had a good time. Uh, it was a good weekend to uh, to spend time with uh, you know friends and other people on the radio and uh, practice what it would be like if there was a major national communications and infrastructure disaster. And now that we're out of the exercise, you know, we can. I'll talk a little about the scenario this year. The folks who didn't get to participate want to know what went on. Well, it was a scenario that was based off of a combination of physical and cyber attack being uh, perpetrated by a fictional nation uh, that was attacking the U.S. and trying to destabilize the U.S. So we saw critical infrastructure attacks in the exercise. Uh, We saw a variety of different physical attacks for uh, communications, uh, infrastructure Uh, military assets, a a lot of different things that could very plausibly happen if we found ourselves in a real-world scenario, a real-world situation where we were being attacked by a foreign power. So it was a good exercise. Uh, We learned a lot. Uh, There were also the second and third order effects of that sort of attack, the humanitarian side of it with people who were caught while traveling, people who were a casualty of traveling, Uh, One scenario that we ran that didn't get to come to fruition due to band conditions and some other problems that made moving traffic difficult uh, in that short uh, 48-hour period was a scenario where someone was flying a private plane to a business meeting. They diverted when the grid went down, uh, and they were unable to return home uh, due to a technical problem and had to ditch the plane. And uh, that was a scenario of trying to locate that person that had to ditch the plane in an emergency because uh, unlike today, if a a plane went down on an interstate or somewhere like that, immediately emergency services would be called and there would be all kinds of information about it. But if no one can make a phone call, 
the people in the immediate area are going to know, and they're probably going to render aid to the pilot, and they're going to try to help. But him getting a message home saying, hey, I am stuck you know, at X location, uh, and I'm okay, but I got to figure out a way home, is a lot more difficult when you don't have a cell phone or a telephone to pick up and make that call. So that's part of the whole thing of learning communications and, and those sorts of things is how do we find solutions to work around these problems if this situation becomes so dire or if a real event happens where these sorts of things uh, aren't available to us. And as we kind of learn every day, our critical infrastructure is pretty fragile. I mean, it's it's very robust compared to what it could be, but it's still it's still very fragile. So one other thing I want to talk about uh, that we identified as a potential shortfall uh, with the T-Rex exercise and, and in our training. And this is that doing a communications exercise once a year. You know, T-Rex is like the, the creme de la creme. It's the thing you train up to. It's the super games of communication uh, where you go to show off all those skills that you've developed during the year. It's, it's not really the place you go in to learn. And because of that, one of the things that we realized is we need more communications exercises. Uh, this once a year thing is great, but there's a lot of people who are only doing this once a year and it shows. Okay, N- Not to pick on you if you were one of those folks, but if you've only done it once and you do this once a year and it's the only time you get on the radio and you do the stuff. It's kind of like the guy that goes to the range once a year, the guy that goes and plays golf once a year. Everybody around knows you only play golf once a year or go target shooting once a year. It's pretty obvious. In order to help mitigate that, because communications is a team sport, it's very hard to do on your own, we're going to work on doing a quarterly communications exercise with PrepperNet. And our first, well, actually won't be our first. We did one last quarter. uh, But our next quarterly communications exercise will be coming up at the end of this month, and it is August 2024, Uh, for anyone who is listening to this at a later time. We'll be doing a communications exercise on August 31st, uh, August 2024, uh, as our third quarter communications exercise. Also going to try to do one in November. So if you're listening to this at a later date, sorry, but there's probably going to be one soon because I want to continue this. Uh, It'll be on a Saturday. Uh, It's not going to be, this one is not going to be a super involved communications exercise. There'll be details about it that come out as we get a little closer. I'll post some things on the PrepperNet.net site, send out a few emails, uh, also send some stuff out on the radio if you participate with us on the radio. But this exercise will consist of uh, a series of net control stations asking at specified times. There'll be two specified windows in the day for what is called a PIR uh, or a primary intelligence requirement. Uh, be a piece of information that we need. They're going to ask for everybody who's participating in the exercise, hey, uh, write me a summary, 150 words or less, uh, put it in an Amron blank form, uh, and send that back to us here in the next hour uh, about this particular thing we're asking about. And it could be something like, for the exercise purposes, you know, tell us about your local weather or something like that. But in a real-world scenario, it could be, hey, uh, we need information about fuel availability and price in everybody's area, or we need a little quick 150-word blurb on what's going on in your community as far as X event goes. So we're going to be sending out some things to get people used to one concisely and precisely in you know, 150 words or less in this case probably, Write us a little little blurb, send it to us, but get all the facts and the details in there as best you can. Send that, and we're going to do that twice, two different bands, so people get some experience on uh, a couple of different radio bands and how those behave and perform. And then we're going to put all that together in a summary for an exercise net later that night where we'll send out a summary of the information that we received so everybody can kind of see their stuff came in, got uh, read, processed, and then sent back out as a product. Uh, so in a how it would work in a real world situation where we were trying to find out information t- to pass either back to everyone or to a specific uh, group that needed information about something. You know, an example of that might be, you know, hey, we're getting rumors of a dam that is failing in XYZ County uh, in North Carolina. But we can't confirm it. We have a priority intelligence requirement. We need someone to put 
eyes on this thing and write us a little blurb of what's going on and send it in. Uh, and if more than one person can do that, that would be great. Uh, that way we can get you know more precise, firsthand information on what's going on that uh, we can depend on. That's part of our exercise for this uh, for this month. Uh, no requirement to you know go out and set up in the field, know anything like that. Just do it from home. Uh, I would request that you know you try to do it off grid if you can. Uh, we are preppers. We are in preparedness. So being able to operate off grid is kind of critical. So I would encourage you to test your off grid stuff. It's a great opportunity to do that. And uh, learn some skills. And the reason I picked around 150 words is around 150 words keeps your transmission uh, using FL Digi and the mode MFSK32 to around a minute. So uh, that, that means your report takes about one minute to transmit. And that's a good time. So if we got 20 people sending reports, we're only tying up a little more than 20 minutes for each person, one after another, to send the reports in. Uh, if you get too long-winded, then it, it really slows things down and makes it really difficult because nobody wants to sit there for a half hour while you send uh, War and Peace. So that's what we're going to do, and we're going to do some more of those. Uh, in November, uh, I really want to run a night op. Uh, it'll probably be a field op in the dark because that always changes perspectives on how to do things. I don't know that for sure, so we'll send out some more information about that when the time comes. But I want to encourage everyone, if you did participate in T-Rex, congratulations, good job. I hope you learned some things, and I hope that you take action based off of what you learned to improve your position every day, improve your fighting position, improve your skills, improve your training. So I hope everyone gained some knowledge from that. If you didn't, and you're listening to this and going, wow, this sounds kind of fun, I want to get involved, I encourage you to come over to the PrepperNet.net website. Sign up if you haven't joined. It's free. And then go check out the Communications Academy. We got a lot of exciting things that are being developed and added there uh, with some information to help you learn everything from how to communicate with your neighborhood watch effectively to how to communicate across the country or join in with the network that we're building so that you can have a way to share information, get messages across the country, and uh, help us grow that network because without people on the ground willing to hop up, take on the responsibility of, hey, I'm going to provide some communication support and I want to get involved with this and I am in you know, wherever you are, uh, if there's nobody else doing that there, then we don't have a way to find out what's going on there and we don't have a way to get information there that you can maybe hopefully get to someone's loved one. So, and you get the benefit of if you have that situation, you know, hopefully we have someone in the area you need to get a message to. It's a team effort. Communications is a team sport. Uh, and it's one of those things that without building those networks now, really hard to do in an emergency. Having those relationships, knowing those folks, building that community, that's what, uh, what PrepperNet's about. It's about getting to know people. It's about finding people with uh, similar ideas, similar mindsets, similar interests, and about similarly prepared because we uh, we can't do this by ourselves. Uh, when something goes sideways, we need that community that's immediately around us. And if you happen to not be in your community that's immediately around you, hopefully you've networked and know someone in the community that you happen to be in when the, the emergency happens, uh, and they can maybe help you get back to where you need to be. So... Uh, that being said, hope you guys are having a wonderful beginning to fall. Fall is my favorite time of year. I love uh, the cooler weather. Uh, the leaves start changing. It's such a, a beautiful time uh, as, that we're heading into here, but it's going to be a crazy one. Uh, this is, this is going to be an interesting year. Everybody kind of feels it and knows it. So uh, don't, uh, don't slack off on that training. I know uh, a lot of people are tied on money at the moment. Radio gear is expensive. I get it. Hopefully, you've already got some radio gear. Training's not expensive. Training is uh, is something, especially with radio. It's not like buying ammunition and uh, other things that are expensive to train. Training on the radio is time, and uh, it, it's a great skill to have, uh, an invaluable skill to have in an emergency to to know what's going on. So, that said. Again, I hope everyone's having a wonderful, uh, wonderful first half of the year here as we uh, head in to the, uh, the trailing end of 2024. We will see you next time. 
This is Patrick from PrepperNet Comms, and thank you for listening to the Prepping Academy podcast. Thanks for listening to the Prepping Academy podcast. Preppers unite at www.preppingacademy.com. Has your data been hacked? Do you feel uneasy about the vulnerability of your personal information online? Were you involved in the Target, LinkedIn, or Microsoft data leaks? Don't know? If not, then pay attention. Join Forrest Garvin from PrepperNet for a free webinar on privacy and security. Gain insights into safe internet browsing, VPNs, crafting online aliases, secure emails, detecting if your data has been hacked, and managing passwords. Secure your spot today for this webinar on privacy and security. It's free. This webinar delves into comprehensive strategies for bolstering your online privacy. We've got you covered from fortifying your passwords to shielding your financial information and mastering state-of-the-art encryption techniques. We're offering two convenient dates to suit your schedule. Reserve your spot now at PrepperNet.com slash privacy. Don't let cyber threats erode your peace of mind any longer. Take the first step toward a safer, more secure online experience by joining us for our free webinar. Remember, knowledge is power when it comes to safeguarding your privacy. Sign up now at PrepperNet.com slash privacy. We'll see you there.